so it's a cautionary tale that you really never know what's happening behind closed doors. A mother accused of beating her eight-year-old daughter to death beyond recognition says evil spirits made her do it. When you have any child, and especially a child who's killed or allegedly killed because of the actions of a parent, it's just heartbreaking. When investigators arrived at a Wayne, Michigan home on March 16th, they say eight-year-old Lila Castle had been beaten so severely she was unrecognizable. Prosecutors say the girl had significant bruising and swelling to her head and neck and was unresponsive when emergency crews arrived to the scene. Lila was rushed to the hospital, where she was later pronounced dead. Now, investigators say the person responsible for her murder is 30-year-old Chelsea Renee Duparin, Lila's mother. Really heartbreaking situation of child abuse. The person, the law enforcement said it was like the worst case he had ever seen of abuse of a child. I sat down with legal analyst and attorney Dina Saig Dahl, who says Lila's injuries were likely the result of repeated abuse. I mean, if you get to the point where your your swelling essentially makes you so unrecognizable, that definitely seems like more than just falling down the stairs. And to be fr quite frank, it sounds like more than just somebody using their hands. It sounds like maybe somebody using uh, something else that's heavier to cause that kind of swelling it sound for the law enforcement official to say he had never seen anything like that it's horrible to think of what may have happened to that child because it, it does sound like a like extreme amount of either repeated punching or somebody was using something you know even worse to hit that child i looked through the mom's facebook and social media and there are so many photos of them together dressing up for trick-or-treating or going to the first day of school and they honestly look very happy like a nice family so is it a shock then that this normal woman who wouldn't have any prior charges all of a sudden would beat her daughter abuse her enough that the young girl would be killed i mean we have seen so many cases like this sierra you know on the network where and and this is why it's always so uh, people should be careful about how somebody presents themselves in the world because People often are very good at showing one side of themselves to the world and a whole other, you know, behind closed doors. And we see that quite a bit in domestic violence cases uh, where somebody may say, oh, I would never have assumed, you know, guessed that that man was doing that to that woman. Or in cases of, of children, especially because children are so vulnerable, they usually would have only the parent to look to for help. And then when the parent is doing this, it's very difficult you know, there's still, you know, allegations of this. We don't know, was this a continuing pattern? Had she abused this child before? But the fact that it was so severe, you would think that it probably wasn't the first time. And yeah, people are, are good. People who are abused are good at covering up. Abusers are good at covering up. And, it, and so it's a cautionary tale that you really never know what's happening behind closed doors. Michigan officials have pinpointed Wednesday, March 13th as the day Lila was beaten, but it's still unclear whether her mother used some sort of object during the abuse. After that, prosecutors say Chelsea Duperon put her daughter in a bed and went to the store where she bought Vaseline, liquor for herself, and diapers for Lila because the girl was so weak she couldn't even use the bathroom. I mean, she knew that her child couldn't physically get up to go to the bathroom, so she got these diapers. Is that something that prosecutors would consider? The fact that she got that, I mean, just a horrible detail uh, because it shows that the mother was aware of the situation her her child was in this kind of tragic situation her child is that couldn't even get up that's how injured she was and the mother knew that it wasn't until three days after lila was first beaten that an emergency call was made if 911 had been called earlier if the girl hadn't just been in her bed for these three days she could have been saved is that something that could factor into the case as it moves forward it would factor into the case maybe in terms of was there somebody else in the house that could have called 911 or did somebody stop by during those i think it was three days between the time they think that she was abused to the time that she died was there anybody else who knew that this child was injured and didn't call 911 so i think we may see more charges if that's the case and that's where the failure to call 911 is so uh would come into play 
perhaps if she had called 911 earlier, well, if she had called 911 and the child had been saved, she wouldn't be facing murder charges for one thing, right? And even if she had called 911 and, and the child had been dis saved, it's possible that the, the prosecutor would have been willing to charge her with a lesser crime or certainly during sentencing, the fact that she had tried to save her child could have come in. But as you know, she didn't do that here. Uh, and whether or not the failure of anybody else who knew what was happening didn't call it would be a whole separate crime for that person. When investigators first interviewed Duperon, she told them Lila had fallen down the stairs, but quickly changed her story, saying bad spirits urged her to hurt the girl. Why is it that the mother would have changed her story so drastically after speaking with investigators? It's possible that she realized that her that the, they weren't buying the fact her, her first story right i mean this is what i would think you know again this is all has to still be proved in a court of law but that she thought that the easiest way to get herself out of it was to say the child fell down the stairs and and she saw the faces right on the detectives when she said that and they saw the injuries and they know that those didn't happen from somebody falling down the stairs and so she changed her story and she changed it to something that she thought would get her off that like something else compelled me to do it i was out of my mind i mean that's the view that's maybe the more cynical view but i think that's the view of the case that I, as i see it do Perrin was ultimately charged with first degree child abuse and felony murder felony murder doesn't require an intent to murder and i think that was why they did charge her with this in this case because one of the underlying crimes with felony murder is let's say you go and commit a burglary and during the burglary somebody dies you can be charged with felony murder because you intentionally commit the burglary and one of the crimes that can become felony murder is first degree child abuse which if they could show the intent to commit the child abuse probably fairly easily but did she then intend to commit the murder? They don't have to show that she intentionally murdered her child. They just have to show that she intentionally abused her child. And during the course of that, her child died. So it's much easier. They don't have to um, have the intent to kill, but it's still first degree. It's still punishable by life without parole in Michigan. Saig Dahl says if Duparent's defense is insanity, she has a long road ahead. It's very difficult to get to um, to be acquitted by reason of insanity because, it, for one thing, the burden to show whether or not the defendant was insane at the time of the act is on the defense. As we know, prosecutor normally has the burden of proof to show somebody is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But when you assert a defense like insanity, the defense actually has to prove that. And they have to prove that they were basically, they were substantially unable to appreciate the nature of their actions. And that's very difficult. That, that It's a high level. It's not just even, I heard spirits. It's that I heard spirits and I was still unable to appreciate that when I was abusing my child, that's actually all they, the prosecutors need to prove, that she was unable to appreciate that by hitting her child, she was abusing her child. That's a very difficult thing for defense to prove. It's going to take a lot more than just her saying that she heard spirits. It would have to show probably a history of it, uh, that she was really, you know, so incapable of it. But I'm wondering if you are the defense attorney in this case, is that the route you go talking about the evil spirits or is there another defense to these pretty serious charges? It's probably the only defense I could think of. And the fact that she already said it as an attorney, you would uh, use that statement. But again, that was her second statement. So it's not even that strong because the first she said that she fell down the stairs, so, you know, that even showed that she was aware. And yes, that was after the fact of the crime, but it, but it shows that maybe she's just lying, right? That she's changing her story, that she's just lying. It doesn't even make it seem credible. But I don't think as a defense attorney, you have that many good arguments in a case like this. I mean, clearly you can't argue something like self-defense. You didn't have anything like that um, come up or I mean, you, you're dealing with a child, you're dealing with a parent and a child. There really aren't many defenses, if any, you can come up with. So they, they might go down that road, even if it's not very good since she changed her story. 
it wasn't even the first thing that she said. And do parents' trip to the store to purchase diapers doesn't really back up an insanity defense. So her getting the diapers shows an awareness of the situation, that, that her daughter was injured enough to need this. And so I think it will cut against any defense by reason of insanity or incompetency that she was she was aware. She was aware that her child couldn't couldn't get up and use the bathroom. There, there, it shows a, like an awareness that the prosecutors will certainly use if she ends up trying that as a defense. Do parents' alcohol purchase doesn't favor an insanity defense either. So that would be a uh, detail that the prosecutor would use is maybe you heard spirits because you were drunk, right? And if you are um, on um, drugs or if you're drinking, those are the kind of facts that a prosecutor can bring in to show that your your level, you know, even if you were seemed insane, it was because of that and not actually because of any mental illness or what's going on in your brain. Or if you're incompetent, it's because of the intervening alcohol or drugs and not because of anything that's going on inside of you. Even if she doesn't use the insanity defense, it's possible do parents' competency comes into question. So they're slightly different things in that the the, the defense by reason of insanity is at the time of the alleged crime. Was she sane or not sane then? And that's what the jury would decide if she puts that in front. The idea of competency comes in and whether or not she's competent to stand trial at the time of the trial. And we saw with Lori Dable how she had her trial continually delayed because she kept on failing the competency test at the time of the trial. And that determination is whether or not they're aware enough of their proceedings that are happening, can they assist in their own defense? That's essentially the question. And so the timing of it is a little bit different. So it's possible that even if she doesn't have a great insanity defense at the time, of the alleged killing, that she is could still be incompetent to stand trial if indeed this idea of spirits is true and perhaps there's even more and she gets evaluated, you know, by the the psychiatrists and the mental health experts, she could say they could determine that she was incompetent to stand trial, in which case that would be another reason for the trial to be delayed if there was one. Where do you see the case going from here, that it would end in a plea deal or actually end up going to a jury trial? It's a really good question because I don't think that the prosecution will offer her a plea that she would like. I mean, you're, you're dealing with a severe case. It seems right now that you're dealing with a severe case of child abuse. And those kind of cases are really going to get prosecuted to the fullest. So they may not off, be able to offer her anything that she wants. And in that case, she would rather take it to a jury, try to maybe bring up this uh, insanity. Maybe there are more details in her past that supports this uh, defense of insanity and, and she thinks she has a chance. It's the, so it's really hard to always know, you know what is in the minds of a defendant. She could also maybe feel um, you know, really bad about this and not want to go to the, um, and, you know, go ahead and take a plea deal because she wants to move on and doesn't want to have to face a jury. So it's sometimes hard to know, but I don't think that she's going to be offered a plea deal that would necessarily incentivize her not to go to trial. Du Perrin appeared in court this week where she pleaded not guilty to the charges. She's now being held in the Wayne County Jail without bond, awaiting her next court appearance on March 25th. Reporting for Long Crime, I'm Sierra Gillespie.